<laughs> Sorry, I forget that little tidbit. <laughs> um, last year we got a lot of feedback from the students and they wanted to have more students present this year. And if anyone took the time to read through the bios, I wanted to stand up right now and give a hoorah so we can all give you a big hand around applause. Thank you very much for doing that. You're on the road to professionalism. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce you folks to some people. Um, first person I'd like to introduce you to is we've had a transition in Boulder this year. <laughs> and for those of you who may or may not know that, we have a new CEO who's at the helm of the Association of Economists. On to the council. So at this time, I would like to invite uh, Paul Sharilla. Um, and at this point, the people, the, made this conference happen is a down. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point I'd also welcome my folks host an AE conference is there is the AE symbol which is an apple and to pull from the host committee because she's going to take on the leadership of next year's conference and I want you to hear about that. So Leslie Shriver come on up here. When we combine. So, I need people to help me run next year's conference. Thank you. Might be something you're really jazzed about doing or something that you want to see done differently. And that's great. Or even if you've been coming to these conferences for years. Here, April 13th, 14th, and 15th. And it's in New York in the Catskills at Frost Valley YMCA. They said it was good. Yeah. But it's in the middle of nowhere, supposedly. Uh, but that's okay. That's all right. Um, so please come. Bolton Valley, all the way down. That was impressive. Okay, but your award is for inventing a wilderness orientation program, more, and le more or less from scratch over the last few years. And Ryan's achievement is being on his adventure path and contributing to the field. And as he shared stories, metaphors, and lessons of children, curiosity, and character. Josh passed away nine months later, and as a region, we wanted to capture the essence and wisdom of experienced practitioners. The Northeast region, Julie Clemens has the privilege of interviewing Keith. Julie is a woman of many talents, from building her own sea kayak. I think that's significant because when we were getting ready for this, I asked him um, for a resume or a CV or something like that so that I would have, you know, basic biographical information. Um, not only did he provide it immediately, it was up to date, more up to date than my resume. Um, and it also included professional objectives, which I'm going to read to you right now, three of them. Number one, to assist individuals. Um, they were excited to have a class speaker because it meant no work for them. Keith marched in, said hello, sat down on the floor in the corner of the room, crossed his arms over his chest and said, so, what the hell am I doing here? Those students never worked harder for a class in their whole lives. Uh, so I advise you not to miss an opportunity to corner this man and make him teach you. You won't regret it. Well, you might regret it for a little while. <laughs> like if you had somewhere to go right away. <laughs> Asking Keith a question is kind of like turning on a fire hose when you're not holding on to it. Um, but. This guy's been around a long time. He's been with AEs literally since the beginning. He's had a lot of successes, and he's made more mistakes than any of us have had time to. Um, and so I would definitely advise you to listen to him because he'll tell you what he's learned, and it'll save you a lot of time, and it'll put you on the path to making a whole new crop of mistakes of your own. So with that said, Keith, would you like to join me up here so I don't feel so alone? Thank you. I'm not going to stand here very long. I'm going to sit. I'm going to sit down in a minute. But I would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I had an idea and knew that I was going to receive this honor about six months ago. And you have been teaching me since then. You have been teaching me. I thank you for that. A good friend of mine, John Huey, who, was, who used to be the director of NCOBS in North Carolina with Mellon, once told me that when you make a speech, you should probably get them to laugh before you get them to think. I have an attempt here. I need to read it because I wouldn't remember it. It's too confusing. An attempt to get you to laugh. Then we'll take this thing out of here and we'll sit down and Julie and I will talk to each other. And you can listen if you wish. I think that's the beginning. It's easy to the word understand the word up, UP, meaning towards the sky or the top of the list, or what you do when you wake up in the morning. And why do you, when, when you wake up in the morning, why do you wake up? At a meeting, why does the topic come up? Why do people speak up? And why do officers, why are officers up for election? And why is it up to the sec secretary to write up the report? We call our friends up. We brighten up a room. We polish up the silver. We warm up the overload, uh, leftovers. We clean up the kitchen. We lock up the house. Some guys fix up their cars. People stir up trouble. They line up for tickets. They work up an appetite. They think up excuses. To be dressed is one thing, to, but to be dressed up is special. And this up is confusing. We drain, the drain must be opened because it is stopped. We open the store in the morning and we close the store at night. It seems a little mixed up about up. <laughs> to acknowledge the proper uses of up, look up the word up in the dictionary. A desk, a desk sized dictionary takes almost a quarter of a page and it can add up to about 30 definitions. If you were up to it, you might, be tr you might try building a list of, many, of the many ways can be used. It will take a lot of time. And, and if you don't give, you might, end, wind, wind, you might wind with a hundred or more. When it threatens to rain, we say it's clouding. When the sun comes up, we say it's clearing. When it rains, it gets wet, it wets the earth and, maces, and often messes things. When it doesn't rain for a while, things dry, fess up. You kind of like this, don't you? I could go on for on and on, but I'll wrap it. For it's now time for me. To, my time is up. Uh, up uh, my time is, and it's time for me to shut. Did you laugh? Okay. And I will now leave this up to Julie. Take this thing out of here, will you? Don't drop it down. I'm sure glad they didn't screw. <laughs> okay, so 
Keith and I have spent some time practicing getting ready for this, and uh, I'm still a little nervous. I really love public speaking, as many of you, I'm sure, do. Um, so I think we're just going to sit here and kind of pretend we're having a little chat and yeah. just ignore the fact that 300 people are looking at yeah. us. And, yeah. So, um, so I have some questions to ask Keith that I'm hoping will prompt. Um, he's told me a lot of really interesting stories over the years, and so I'm hoping to to kind of get those out of him in this setting. <laughs> the first thing I'm going to ask you about, Keith, is um, some of your views on teaching and being a teacher. Um, you've spent a lot of time thinking and talking and wondering about how people learn. Um, you told me about your dad and how he was one of your first and best teachers. And I was wondering if you want to tell us a little bit about him. Yeah. My dad and I were good friends. If I choke up a little right now, I need to tell you that my son died the 1st of December, and he was a good friend also. I, that bothers me a little. When I was in seventh grade, I went to school to my dad. He was a physical education teacher. No, he was a people teacher using physical education. Ooh. Is there a difference there? Can you hear me? And he was teaching in a junior high school. He taught there for 37 years in the same building. And I thought I was a pretty good runner. And he took, to, took a picture of me one day when I was trying to run as fast as possible. And he gave me the picture about two days later. This is, a, this is a sprint at the end of 50 yards. That's what I look like. He didn't say a thing. I went to him about two days later, and I said, that's not very good. He says, yeah, that's right. And about a week later, he took another picture, and it was drastically different. And in 50 yards, I'd knocked off two tenths, which is a significant number in 50 yards. That's the kind of a teacher he was. He had to do something in the summer so he could, could afford to teach. So he used to take canoe trips with some of the kids in the school. There was a public school in Montclair, New Jersey, up, Upper Montclair. And when I was eight, he took me along. I was probably a real pain in the butt. By the time I was 12, I was the cook. By the time I was 15, he let me think I was running the thing. That's how good a teacher he was. I may learn many, many things because of him. And some of that will come out later on. Is that what you wanted to know? That's great. You have a bachelor's and a master's degree in phys ed from Springfield College. Yeah? Thank you. Yes. Um, and you've also talked a lot about the, your continuing education, both formally and through life, and you mentioned to me once that you earned something like 136 credits past your master's, but you didn't, you chose not to go for a PhD. And I wondered if you want to talk a little bit about why. Well, I kind of rebelled at the... Imagine that. Oh, this was in 1966, I think it was. I took a year off, I, well, start again. My bachelor's and my master's was at Springfield, and my doctorate work was at Springfield, and one of the requirements, if you took a doctorate in the same institution, at least at Springfield, was to bring in a number of transfer credits, just because they wanted to spread you out. So I went to University of Massachusetts and studied experiment, uh, uh, instrumentation for some electronics, and I went to UNH and took geology and uh, and, and went to New, Un University of Maine and Toledo and a couple other places. 
And I took a year off at sabbatical in 66. My wife worked real hard at the library so I could do it. And the kids were still in school, still in high school at the time. And I took my written exam, like in December, and rebelled at that because they didn't tell me who was going to be reading the answer. And to me, that would be, I need to be able to write for the person who's reading. And then there was an oral. And they asked me some questions which were absolutely bananas. My mind is more valuable for thinking than it is as a repository of trivia. And they were asking me trivia. And I told them to go to hell. The only, there were two people who were disappointed. Mary, my wife, for a little while, because she had committed to making it possible for me to go to school. And I had a good time at school. I we raised hell down there. But. And my college pre president, because he didn't have another PhD on the, credit, on, the, on the roster, I was given an opportunity to flunk or pass the test again in the following September. And I, I did the two days of writing, complaining completely about who was writing, who was reading it. They didn't like it. And so I wrote what I wanted. And they didn't like what I, I was saying because they were asking me opinions. And I was giving them opinions, and it wasn't their opinion. And then I told them to go to hell again within the first 15 minutes of the oral. So yes, I have 137 credits from six different institutions studying ecology, geology, the natural environment, <coughs> excuse me, and primarily learning. But I don't have a paper for it. And I said before I started, I'm going to go get an education. I don't give a damn whether the paper comes with it or not. And I lived up to it. And I'm proud of that, damn it. Little vocabulary word tonight, iconoclast. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> Your official title, official title, it's on the website, on the AEE Council is curmudgeon. <laughs> I wondered if you could tell us where that name came from and how you define curmudgeon. If I'd known you were going to ask me that question, I would have Ed, Edward Abbey's quote, <laughs> which is about a, a, a short paragraph, which is very appropriate. And I, I'm not very good. I'm not a verbal person. I don't re memorize well. I'm a, ver a visual and a motor learner and a kinesthetic thinker and a and a visual thinker, but I'm not a verbal person. Now, a lot of people disagree with that because they, they say I speak well. Well, I think one reason I speak well is because I read your feedback well, which is a motor thing, and it's a visual thing, not a verbal thing. And you people right now are giving me very interesting feedback. <laughs> no, I mean it. I respect that. You look as if you're interested. Now, you either you're damn good fakes or you are. So I thank you for that. Why did I get onto that one? I'm not sure. <laughs> Neither am I. So even if you can't remember what Edward Abbey said, and I think that's oh, okay, a pretty familiar quote you. to a lot of people. Um, but what does it mean to you when you use that word? I started reading Dewey hmm, 50 years ago. I've been reading them ever since. But I think the most interesting publication with Dewey's name on it is something that most people don't even know exists. It's a, a publication called How We, How, How we Think, which is a collection of some of his stuff, which was published in 1910. Now, if you know anything about Dewey and the dates of Dewey, most of his stuff came out in 24, 28, and 36. So this is an early Dewey thinking. And Dewey is impossible to read in 19, uh, 2000 verbiage. Just, you've got to rewrite it in your verbiage to understand what the hell he's trying to say. 
and his 1910 verbiage is even worse than the 1936 verbiage. So in my interpretation of, or my reading, oh, by the way, excuse me, my concept of reading, what's yours, is what I'm thinking about while I'm looking at the words. My concept of listening is what I'm thinking about while you're talking at me. There might be a relationship between what's on the paper and what's going on up here, but sometimes no. Okay? So my reading of Dewey's first four chapters and how we think, and the rest of it is really interesting but just supports it, is the fourth level of thinking. The first level is just stuff that's running around in your head. The second level is stuff that you get and don't do anything. Like you watch the news and say, ah, what's going on? The third level is the beginning of his reflective thinking. He doesn't use that term. And the fourth level is reflective thinking, which you are working on something which is uncomfortable to your, what's up there to begin with. And it's uncomfortable, therefore most people don't do it because it's uncomfortable. It's questioning their current beliefs or wherever things are. And that's what I have termed curmudgeon thinking. I believe that I was born curious. I believe you were born curious. I believe most schools and most parents before you get to school train you. That verb is important. To lose or not be curious. They don't do it on purpose. But I think some schools do numb them. I was teaching in Halifax, Nova Scotia in my second year of teaching. I was teaching, trying to teach people through physical education in Halifax in 1950. 1950. Just hold on. 1952. Bar your mic. In 1952, I was working for a workshop with a bunch of Halifax elementary school teachers, half of whom were nuns in habit, because Halifax at that time had a dual school system, Protestant school, Catholic school on the other side of the road. And in the front row, of which there may be 200 people, there was this little old nun in habit. She must have been 103. And she probably weighed 87 pounds soaking wet, sitting on the edge of the bleacher, just eating up everything I said. And she kind of scared me, but we took a break and she came up to me and said, where did you learn all that stuff? And without thinking, which is sometimes a very good indication of where your brain is, I didn't think of the answer, but I came out with the following comment. My father made me curious. I got my formal education from Springfield College because at that particular time I had just a bachelor's degree. I'd been out of school for two years. But kids have taught me most of what I know. That statement can only be added to by saying, I got my formal education from Springfield College and some other, but people have taught me most of what I know. There are a number of people in this audience with whom I've worked, officially as teacher, or whatever. I thank them for being here, but you taught me more than I taught you. One of my Challenges to myself when I left college the first time. I graduated in June. Mary and I got married in August, and we moved to Nova Scotia in September. We went on to Nova Scotia on a honeymoon and rented a, a, an apartment 
and came back two weeks later and went to work. Well, why did I go on that one? Boy, my short-term memory is going to hell. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I, I forget it. It must not be very good. Okay. It'll come back. So I feel like I secede control when I give up the microphone. Oh, wow. But that's all right. We can keep trading back and forth. I was going to ask you about, um, you had went to work at Keene State College, and you were teaching there for some time. And around 1969, you had a big transformation in the way you thought about teaching people. And I wanted to know if you could tell us some more about that. You can have this microphone if you want. No, uh, let, let me try this. Just hold it further away. I went to Keene with the expressed desire to work in teacher preparation in physical education. That was important to me. I also had gone to Vermont to teach. I was going to teach there for four, five years, but I ended up with doing it for only three because this position opened at Keene. And I went there with a specific purpose of teaching people through activity so they could teach people through activity. That's a funny way to say that, isn't it? Oh, funny. That's an odd, not a common way to make that statement. And that's very important. I was a very good instructor in my definition of instruction. Oh, by the way, this definition of instruction, which I am going to present to you right now, is only about 10 days old in my vocabulary. This is a new idea. How old am I? Okay. I got people to where they should be, in my opinion. Well, in my opinion, they should be. I got them there effectively and efficiently and quickly. I was able to find out whether they were there or not, whether it was knowledge. I was teaching academic or classroom work and theory work and also skills work. I, if we were working on soccer, I found out whether they had the soccer skills. I, I tested them well. I was a good instructor because my concept of instructing is my job is to give you, present to you the information, the knowledge, the ideas, the opinions, and the opportunity to, to, to work it and also maybe demonstrate and give you a chance to become skilled and test that. I was a good instructor, effective. A lot of people said so, not just the students. Then one day a kid asked me, her name was Sandy Simakopoulos. That was 1969. Do you remember who he stirred you up in 1969? Okay. She said, what right? She didn't ask this question this way, but this is what the question amounted to. This is what I heard her ask. What right do you have to tell me what I should get out of what you're teaching? I said, I don't. Well, you are. I said, I am. And the thing that blew me out of the water was the fact that I didn't realize I was doing it. Not that I was doing it. I didn't realize I was doing it. So I had a mental breakdown. I was mentally sick for six weeks. I went to my dean. At that time, I was director, the depart, department chairman, director of athletics, teaching 18 credits, coaching two sports, working 360 hours a week, you know, that kind of stuff. So I promoted myself back down to teaching and doing nothing but teaching. And my definition of teaching now is when I give you the opportunity to learn and show that you know the skills, and know the information to support that, those skills, then that's instruction. But when I now give you an opportunity to do something with that skill and knowledge, like give you an experience, and I have no right to say that this is where you should be when you get finished with that experience. 
I, can ha I do not have the right to control the outcome. I have the responsibility to control the input. You, as the learner, have the responsibility to control the outcome. What you do with it and where it takes you is your, and that is my com concept of, in a pure and perfect world, the concept of what teaching is as, as against instruction. So I began to try to teach. I went to Outward Bound in Minnesota, ran into a guy named Dyke Williams for a 10-day teacher practicum, and he was loaded for bear. He didn't know me from Adam, but I was loaded for bear, and we fought that bear together, and we had a ball. I did my first rock climbing. I was 42 years old. Holy smoly. I ran a kind of a storefront eco center on the bottom of Mount Monadnock. I climbed Mount Monadnock about 68 times. I wore out two pairs of boots on the mountain. I went back to school teaching 12 credits. I had nothing else to do. And I ran into Dobsey, Dartmouth Outward Bound. And I have not been the same since. I came away from that experience teaching a January course, D6, so hyper, so excited, so far off the ground, that the guy who took my place as chairman called me in after three weeks after I got back from that Outward Bound course. He said, sit down, please. I said, I can't. He said, that's the trouble. You're driving us absolutely bananas. Do something with it. What? I don't care, but get off our backs. That was the beginning of a program which I established at Keene called Operation Live. It's Operation Live, not project. Operation is a verb. Project's a noun. Or use that way. Live was an acronym, a very accurate acronym. L-I-V-E. -E. Learning in a vigorous environment. And a vigorous environment is any place in which you are uncomfortable. I am in a vigorous environment right now. I'm not immensely uncomfortable. I'm having a blast. But I'm psyched and I'm ready and I'm focused and I'm going on it. And most of us don't get in vigorous environments often enough. We don't put our people in vigorous. Will did last night, didn't he? He showed some pictures that, ooh, that watermelon was a vigorous environment. And I started to teach rather than instruct. Does that help? Did I answer your question? It's getting there. I Get. want to ask you a little bit more about um, Operation Live and, and a, a big part of that. I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about how it actually worked and um, also about the different class projects that you did. And some of them, you've talked about some of them as being more successful and some of them being less successful. Oh. And I'd, I'd like you to talk about what they were and why you think some of them were more or less successful. Uh, you might have to cue me in because I'm going to go off on a tangent here someplace. Okay, first, tell us about the Operation second, Live and how it worked. The first, the first meeting of this outfit, which really wasn't a meeting of this outfit, was a meeting in North Carolina, Boone, and Appalachian State University called Outdoor Pursuits in Higher Education, set up and run by North Carolina Outward Bound School, and it was just a group of people who were doing some of these stupid things in the woods. At that particular time, we had had, we had built a ropes course on the college campus at Keene, and I had been running weekend uh, courses, programs, where we left on Friday afternoon, came home on Sunday night, and uh, well, over the period of 18 years, I backpacked the New Hampshire seacoast 27 times that kind of thing, run by kids to a great extent when they were ready with nothing, nothing really fancy. And in the, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s, we were able to get away with all kinds of, 
I mean, we were, we were running ropes courses with a goal line bowling around the waist through steel carabiners, no hats. I mean, we were crazy, but we did it. Boy, we'd have all kinds of trouble nowadays. The second meeting we had was in Estes Park, which is a, which is a landmark time because of Willie Unsel. He made a statement, it took him an hour and 20 minutes, called outdoor pursuit, I mean, the spiritual value of willingness. I had taken my graduate assistant, which really was the misnomer because we didn't have a graduate program to support graduate assistants, but, but that's the only thing we could call it. And my dean was on my side, which was kind of neat. You can do an awful lot of stuff when you have a tenure and the dean is on your side. You can raise hell. But we drove, David and I and Liz drove to Estes Park in a Volkswagen. I don't know if that's long enough. Okay. Right. In a Volkswagen van, went to this Estes Park in which there were 150 more people than they expected and listen to Willie. And we came away from that statement with fire in our belly. And in my belly, it was, oh boy, it's still there. One of the questions the kids were asking me, the kids on the live, in the LIVE program, who were at that time maybe 100 kids on campus who were real interested in what we were doing, we're beginning to ask the administration, why can't we do this and why can't we do that? And the administration was a very uh, unliberal and restricted. And so I said, I don't know, let's try. So I established a thing called the Living Learning Semester. The easiest way to describe that is I went to my businessman who I played squash and handball with. I said, Jim, you got a minute? He says, for Keith, for you, I got a minute. That's the kind of a relationship we had. It's a real need. And I said, if I took 20 kids, which is my teacher-pupil ratio at college, for 20, for, for 20, for 12 credits, which is my teaching load, off campus for a semester. Picture that? Would you pay me? Because he was a businessman. He said, I don't know, why not? Try. So I went to him in about three weeks and I said, I got three options and I outlined them. I had planned it pretty well. And he, he says, he asked some questions. He said, I like that one. Okay, I'll, I'll be back in three weeks. I came back in three weeks with that one with three options and I, I outlined them. He says, I like that one. I said, okay. He says, sit down. He asked me some questions, gave me a piece of paper with some numbers on it. He, Here's your budget. I haven't even seen the dean yet. The hell with the dean. Do it. So for the next seven semesters, spring semesters, I ran a living learning semester built upon some of the things that Willie was doing at Evergreen, some of the things that Lance Lee was doing in the apprentice shop in Bath, and some of the things that Bob MacArthur was doing at Dobsey with a living learning term. I didn't do everything they did because Lance was spending a lot of time running around looking for money, and I didn't have to look for money, and I could take the good things that he was doing and forget the things that, and the same thing with what Willie was doing. And we had a real good time. One of the problems, one of the, one of the courses was a three-credit course where everybody, anywhere between 12 and 16 or 18 kids, depends on what, what semester, did a group hands-on project. And since I was interested and skilled in wood, and I had the tools, most of those projects ended up being wood. The first semester we rebuilt the house we were living in. And the second semester we built a king post bridge with horses and adzes. Oh, that was, oh, that was, and the third semester we built a log cabin for the city of Keene. And we were having more difficult, a little difficulty finding those projects. And I ran on to this schooner, which had been started in Bath. And I knew the guy who was doing it. He was, he was an ex-apprentice at the apprentice shop, which we had done a lot of service work with. And he said, I'll sell it to you for $1,500 and I'll give you either. Okay, fine. 
So I started out, oh, boy, that's just what we want, boy. That, that'll, that'll really grab their attention. Well, one of my screw-ups, one of my many, 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 many mistakes was it didn't work. The kids weren't interested, or they were interested, but they were afraid of the schooner. It took me two or three semesters to try to figure out why they want these kids to get into the schooner. It's really exciting for me. Well, if I had finally figured out that they weren't going to see the end of it. It was too big. And I finally also figured out that they weren't skilled with their hands, and they didn't want to be, put, be the one who put the plank on that didn't work. And I learned a lot of things from them. Eventually, we killed the program because we were running out of what, do we can, what can we do, kids, and, and beginning to gather and attract the attention of what do I have to do, kids, the kids who didn't really want to be in school, but their old man wouldn't let them quit bit. And I wasn't interested in what do we have to do, kids. I was interested in what can, what, what can I do, kids. So we killed the program, but I had a schooner. Unfinished, not even, fin un not even well, kind of started. <laughs> and they did a lot of things. They built a couple roofs over it, and they moved it around a lot. And they, fooled, uh, but, and they did all kinds of things, but they refused to work on the boat itself. Well, I, I bought the schooner from the college. The president was on my side. That's kind of neat to have, too. And I bought, he, he paid $1,500 for it when we moved it from Bath, and I, I paid him a dollar for it eight years later, and it's now mine, with a bill of sale and everything. You know? And so I, now I had a schooner and no help. Well, I said, I always wanted a schooner, so I started to build it. There's one guy in here who came up and helped me. He spent, what, all, all one summer, David? What a hell of an experience that was for me. But it was even more an experience for him. He was the guy who taught me I was dyslectic. Here I'm 52 years old and didn't know I was dyslectic? Holy smokes, what the hell's wrong with our educational system? Isn't one of the things that we should be doing with kids to give them an opportunity to learn how they, how they learn and some of their talents and some of their weaknesses and some of their passions and some of the things they hate? That's not on a curriculum, is it? So, in 1986, we launched the schooner. It didn't sail last summer for a number of reasons. It's going to get in the water this summer, I hope. I'm working on it. It started to get warm enough. I started working on it last, last week. I hope to have it in the water in June. And you are all invited to come. But don't come on the same day, please. <laughs> I mean it. Both ways. If you are interested in sailing on a 29-foot schooner with a 9-foot bowsprit, a schooner is a two-masted vessel, a multi-masted vessel with a foremast short. The short one is the foremast. This is a two-masted schooner. It's a replica of a 37-foot coasting schooner from British Columbia. It's a beautiful boat. It's the pirate ship of Mount of, of Lake Winnipesaukee, painted black. And it has a skull and crossbones on one of the... Mm. Uh, all I need, hey, maybe you can help me. I'm looking for a cannon. <laughs> I want to put it on the foredeck. And when the Mount Washington, which is a, it's a big ship that goes around, comes across, I want to shoot across the bow. Just as a little uh, personal aside, Keith had invited me onto the schooner many times and I didn't really think he was serious. And then I actually did take him up on it and it was one of the best days ever. I, brought, I had brought a small group of my students and um, Keith lives in, in Alton, which is way down the tip of Winnipesaukee and it's sort of narrow down there. And um, he rode us all out to the schooner and said, you know, here's the bow, here's the stern, don't fall off. And uh, sailed us out to where there was enough room so you wouldn't hit anything. And pretty much sat down, put his feet up and looked at the rest of us and said, well, 
go ahead. And we all, <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> but it was wonderful. I got a comment, please. Okay. One of the things that Will Lang taught me without even knowing he was doing it, and I, I'm very conscious of the verb there, that Will taught me without knowing he was doing it. On the first Outward Mound course I taught for Will and Bob MacArthur at Dopsy in the winter January of 1970, was that Will was satisfied I had been instructed well. I knew my material, I was skilled, I was concerned, I was caring, I had empathy, I was, I knew what they were trying to do. So he taught me in my do, new definition of teaching by leaving me alone. That, when I did that, that was, I started doing that before my metamorphosis and that was a real difficult thing for me to do, is to let the kids have it themselves. Don't force them to do a thing. Give them a chance to do something, watch what they do, and if you're not willing to accept it, then give them a chance to do something else, which they might come up and do it what, the way you want. But you have no, excuse me, I have no right to say this is where you should go with this thing. That is my opinion. That is what I mean by teaching. I probably have to instruct before I'm able to teach. That's what I did with those kids. I said, here, go. They couldn't have, they couldn't have drowned. They couldn't have killed themselves. It was only my boat, and it really didn't make much difference. And since I made it, I could fix it. One thing I have noticed, um, I remember thinking about this during last year's Josh Minor dialogue series when Phil Costello was talking about project use in the early days. Um, and I'm sure some folks in the room remember this too. And, and the energy and excitement around creating mm. the project and having no idea from one day to the next, you know, what was going to happen or where the money was going to come from or where the office was going to go or, you know, where the students were really i mean i think they knew that most of the time but it was it was it seemed that it was barely controlled chaos and and it was amazing and positive and when you talk about operation live i also hear you talking about the same thing the the joy of the creation in a program um and one of the reasons i think about that is my job now i'm stewarding a program that's almost 100 years old the dartmouth outing club and I wonder if you have thoughts on that, the creation versus the sustaining of a program, and, and if there are ways to carry that energy along, or whether you think it's better to create and destroy programs on a regular basis. <clears throat> the joy of discovery, the willingness to take chances, the risk taking of doing something you've never done before is contagious. It's infectious, but it's contagious. And it's exciting as hell. Good learning is messy, noisy, inefficient, time consuming. Schools are made to be neat, clean, quiet, orderly. That's not answering your question, but yes. The excitement of discovery and creating and fooling around with ideas and testing them and screwing up and picking up the mess and fixing the screw-ups and learning from it. Hey, by the way, what's your definition of a mistake? 
mine among others. I have about six or seven of them. Is you do something and don't learn anything from it. That's a mistake. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a good thing you did or a bad thing you did. If you didn't learn anything, that's a mistake. About half of what I know, and I'm serious, is a result of screwing up. Right, Leslie? We screwed up a lot, didn't we? You screwed up, and I screwed up, but we screwed up together, and we had a hell of a good time, and we learned a lot. How about you, David? About half of what I know, I got that information from mistakes. There is some information I have I couldn't have gotten any other way. Okay. So there's an excitement there. And when you are talking about you're working in a program or I worked in a program, which I had been done three or four, well, I backpacked the seacoast 28 times, I think, something like that. And people would say, how can you do that? It must be boring as hell. Well, is your classroom boring? And who made it so? My classroom happened to be the seacoast. And I was comfortable on the seacoast, but they weren't. Therefore, I could make them uncomfortable because I was reasonably comfortable because I had some idea what was going on. And the idea of giving them the chance of being uncomfortable was the strangeness and the excitement. So if you have that routine set up and operational, now you can concentrate on the people. And you don't know where the people are or where they're going to take you or what they're going to do to you or with you or whatever. And that's the excitement. And the excitement of teaching is you're teaching people, not seacoast hiking. Gotcha? Well, that, Jeez, that's I'm clear. having a blast. <laughs> AEE gives out an award that is now called the Michael Stratton Practitioner of the Year Award. Um, in 1987, you received the Practitioner of the Year Award. It wasn't yet called the Mike Stratton Practitioner of the Year Award. Um, and I've heard you talk a lot about Mike and what he meant to you and what he meant to AEE. And do you want to tell us about him? For those who don't realize it, Michael Stratton ran a Bounders program at Carroll School in, in Lexington. Lexington, is it? Lincoln, Massachusetts. It's a school set up and operated for dyslectic kids. And Michael was one of those people who uh, infected you with enthusiasm just because you were in his presence. The first time I really had a chance to sit down and talk with him, I had made a couple arrangements by phone and I met him someplace. But he, Carroll's school was an old, it is an old mansion. The woman who owned it built a bomb shelter after Second World War, a great big cement bunker. And I was looking for a place to lock kids up for a weekend. I mean, I mean it. No lights, food, but solve the problem bit. And Michael was looking for a ropes course, and I had a ropes course, and he had a mom's shoulder, so we swapped. <laughs> but in the process of making those arrangements, you know how much, how much time and energy arrangements make, I went down to see him, and I, and I went into his little shack, which is about 10 by 12 feet, wooden shack, neat and clean, but you couldn't see the walls for the pictures which were around, on the ceiling, and we talked for a little while, and something happened, so he had to get up and leave. He came back in five minutes after I enjoyed looking so home. Oh, oh. And when he walked in the door, I said, Michael, stop right there, please. I have a favor to ask of you. Would you be my mentor? You son of a bitch. I was going to ask you the same thing. 
And so Michael and I became mentors of each other. We didn't interact often, but when we did, it was with some fantastic quality. And AE, as you said, is established a Practitioner of the Year Award. And Michael was the obvious, there wasn't any question. Who else is even close to him? I got that, I think it was in Moodis. And I don't know why they thought I was good at it, but they offered, they, they awarded me that award in Townsend the next year, Townsend, Washington. My acceptance speech, by the way, for that was after everybody applauded and so forth and so on. It's better to remain quiet, silent, and remain and th be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. And I got the standing ovation. And when Mike died, he had brain tumor, and we knew he was going to die for quite a while. That was a hard time. They changed it to the Michael Stratton Award. And he was, well, I've said it. There's a lot of good stories that I have learned from Keith um, when we've been getting ready for this over the last few weeks or so that he's sort of like skipping over because he knows that they're going to take a long time. But I really recommend that you ask him if there's things that he kind of went, oh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Ask him about them because they're good. Uh, you mentioned briefly that um, conference in Boone in 1971, that was the, the beginning of this association. It was, I don't believe it was called AEE at the time, but it was uh, that group turned into this one. Um, so that makes AEE around 35 years old right now. Um, where do you think, what do you think AEE has accomplished in the last 35 years, and where do you think it's going? You ready for this one? What has AE accomplished? Well, personally and selfishly, it's kept me alive. Personally and selfishly, it's kept me alive. With the pizzazz that I have currently. David, can I pick on you for a minute? Has my pizzazz changed much in the last 20 years? Leslie? <laughs> Preston, how long have I known you? 18 years. Has my pizzazz changed much? Only it's increased. <laughs> but it's for a different purpose. I mean, the purpose continually changes. Yes? Again, a guy named Alvin Toffler wrote a book back in the 60s entitled Future Shock. If you have not read that, you shouldn't be here. It's an absolutely prerequisite for life. Alvin Toffler, called Future Shock, you can probably buy it for 40, 75 cents at the local paperback bookstore, used bookstore. Absolutely essential. Okay. What was the question? What does AE accomplish? Oh. <laughs> the first time I heard the word experiential, it was in Mankato, the year after Estes Park, the year after Willie's speech. I went out there in a 15 passenger, four door on each side, airport limousine we call the Big Mac because it came from, from it wasn't McDonald's, it came from, there was a con, con, construction company in town that had been using it, they, they almost gave it to us. They took a carload of 15 people, including about 10 students to Mankato. I think it was the dean of education, but it might have been the dean of the school, was making the keynote speech. There were 500 people in a big gym, well set up. First time I'd ever seen an open concept, uh, sp open space 
we, we ran an open space thing there. That worked pretty nice. That was when the first time I ever heard the word experiential. I'd never heard the word before. I heard it, and the person sit, sitting next to me, I knew it. What was that word? He, he used it again in about 10 minutes, 10 seconds or 10 minutes. I said, there's that word again. That's not a mistake, is it? He means that word. It'd be experiential. He's not talking experimental. He's talking experiential. What the hell is that? I still don't know the answer to that one. I'm, I'm serious. I don't really know what it means other than, hmm, there we go. To me, all A-L-L, -L, big, flashing, bold, red. All learning, no exception, absolute. Don't use absolutes very often. Learning is based upon experience. If you cannot accept that, all learning, then I suggest you need to expand your concept of experience. I would suggest right now you are having an experience. Not because I'm here. I'm having an experience because you're here. All learning is based upon what you have done, are doing, or planning on doing. But experience doesn't teach you a damn thing in itself. The only way you can learn is to use your brain to make synapse connections. Make them, remake them, revert, re, re, reinforce them, make new ones. That's what we call now, Dewey didn't, but we call that thinking now. Now, when you think about something and are critical of it, you are being questionable. You are curious. You are, sh you are asking, is that really the way it should go? Is that the way I should feel? When I did that, I didn't feel very good. Or I felt like, oh boy, or I was tired. You, but the only thing about which you can think, I believe, is something you've done. You can't think about anything. There's nothing else to think about. By done, I mean am doing, thinking about the planning on doing, or, or doing. Or, or I have done. 15 form and attempted to define experiential. It came out a page long. Now what the hell is, how, what good is a definition which is a page long? I contend, and I got this from a kid, a student, that the attitude of the learner defines whether the learning is experiential because all learning is experiential. Therefore, if we use the word experiential in the public domain, we are implying there must be some other kind of learning and we have just shot ourselves in the foot. If we say experiential learning is different than other learning, we're defeating ourselves. That's where I'm at. And that's what experiential education association has done to me, or for me, or with me. Now where's it gonna go? I don't know. I sincerely believe that we will never change the institution of schools because it's too big, there are too many vested interests with a new system. In my opinion, the only, only red flashing bold way we're going to improve schooling is one person at a time, toe to toe, kick him in the shins and do a damn good job teaching. Because that's my... Hey, I got a couple of friends. That's my definition of experiential learning or teaching or education is the, it's, it's dependent upon good teaching.
Now, don't confuse that with good instruction. Because one of the reasons we're in trouble, one of the reasons Bush is locked into no child left behind is because he wants everybody to stop at the instruction level. Now, non-politically, I'm not involved in that politically, it seems to me it's more difficult for a person to become skilled and, at, and be able to use and apply knowledge and skills than it is for them to obtain those knowledge and skills. And in my opinion, almost every school that I know of stops at the, at the acquisition of knowledge and skills, but doesn't in, help people use it. And where you really learn the things which are important in life are the application and the use of those knowledge and, and skills. Gotcha? And the only way, in my opinion, and I think it's a flashing big red only, in bold way, you're gonna change the school system is for you and me to do something to get the teachers to do a better job in going beyond the regurgitation, the recall, the recognition level of how many people in seventh grade can read at the seventh grade level. My daughter, who's, well, she teaches kids. I fooled you, didn't I? You thought I was going to say sixth grade. No, she teaches kids who are in reading and literature and stuff like that. And she spends more time having kids do something with what they read rather than prove they read it. And it's exciting. The kids love it. But they don't like it. They, they're, they're uncomfortable with it because they're not very skilled at it. And I believe you and I can change the educational system of the United States or the world, if that's important in the world, by stop stopping at, you got it, now what are you gonna do with it? It's harder for them to apply it and use it and learn from what it does to them and where it takes them. Kind of, this is, when I started working with kids rock climbing, we, knew, we used Mount Monadnock, which is the southwest corner of New Hampshire, because it's not very far away from Keene, and if I could plan and I could construct a basic rocks one teaching site, it was right there. It was a place there that was fabulous for it. It happened to be up close to the summit, and you could see Boston on a good day, and it rained and all that other stuff. This is a good place. And the instruction in that site was how to tie the knots, the knowledge of what they were supposed to know, and the, the showing of the application. I tested them. That was the instruction. And I did a good job of that. But then I would stop after I saw them do it where they weren't going to get hurt if they screwed up. Okay. I don't know what you call it, but that's what I call it. Then I, I'd literally take off my helmet, toss it up in the air, catch it, put it back on my head, and say, now I am teaching you. I have been instructing you up to now. Now, what you do with the rock and what the rock does to you is up to you. I'm not going to show you how to climb. If you want to climb, fine. If you don't want to climb, I'll answer your questions, probably with another question, but that's not the point. And what they got out of that rock climbing, besides knowledge and skills of being safe and reasonably successful, was the things that the rock taught them. I didn't do a damn thing, except let it happen. Just like Will Lang let it happen to me. He let it go. Now, 
That's where you have an advantage. Because you don't have to be tested by no child left behind. One of the complaints that physical education people had in the 60s and the 70s was that most physical education programs didn't get credit. They weren't graded. And they thought, well, if this is an academically respectable thing, we ought to get credit and ought to be part of graduation and all that kind of stuff. And I used to turn around and say, what do you want to do that for? When they start to give you, have you give credit, they're going to try to tell you what to do. If they don't care what you're doing, then you can do anything you want to, and boy, that's the way we ought to be. And I loved it because they let me alone. It also got screwed up by people who didn't do a very good job because they weren't there. They were teaching because of July and August. And it was a good, it was an easy way to be the soccer coach. Why am I talking like this? This is your program. <laughs> I think you're doing great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am uh, conscious of the time. And I'm starting to think it might be time to yeah. let the audience ask some questions. Is there anything else you want to say before no, we go? I'm on? fine. Okay. Actually, oh, one, one thing, please. This is the commercial. I'm running a workshop tomorrow at 9 o'clock. <laughs> and I'll be here for a long time tonight, as long as you hold me here. And I can sleep on the way home because she's going to drive. Did you bring your outfit for the retro dance party? No. Okay, so if folks have... <laughs> we'll get you an outfit. How's that? So if folks have questions, um, if you just holler real loud or if you want to come up and use the microphone, you're very welcome to. If I haven't annoyed you enough to have you ask questions, I've not done very well. Uh, I have a question, Keith. Sure. Yeah. This is us trying to give experience education. So, I mean, that still allows for all learning to be experienced. It's just that we're the only ones that are educating the way that learning is, is right? Is that well, I suppose that's true. I wrote a paper, which I never, wh where's, uh, where's Pat? Which I ne never submitted to AEE about four executive directors ago. We ought to change the name to AAE. At that time, it was appropriate. It should be Association for Adventure Education. I'm afraid that most of you are here because you like the outdoors. It's a kind of a neat place to be. I'm afraid that we don't have too many classroom teachers here. One, anybody else? Two, three, four, good. But this should be encouraging those people to do a damn good. The best teaching I did at Keene was in the classroom. The most experiential teaching I did, if there is such an animal, is in the classroom. It was very unfortunate I was the outdoor guy. Most of the teaching I did in the last 15 years was based on contracts, even for second graders. It was a verbal contract, which might be good for 10 minutes, but it was their contract, not mine. And if I didn't like it contract, then I didn't approve it, but it was their initiation. I ran courses, academic and skills courses at the college level with contracts. I, is in the elementary and the special education field, it's called IEP. I believe every kid should have an IEP. And I don't know why we can't do that, particularly with computers as we have them now. If you took your 20 kids and sat down for 15, 20, 25 minutes after every, class, every, every day and updated their IEP for tomorrow, you got your lesson plans. We ought to be able to do that. 
I don't know if that answers your question. It responds to your question. Thank you. Anybody else? I dare you. What's an IEP? An IEP is a, an IEP is a in the special education field called an individual educational program. So it's an individual program for each kid. And I believe there's no such thing as special education because everybody is handicapped. I wear glasses. I got one leg which is a little shorter than the other. I'm dyslectic. Okay? And I believe everybody is entitled to an IEP. One of my new brainstorms, oh, I don't know if you're going to like this one or not. Everybody should have an, what did I call it? I, I E W. I, 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 education, individual educational, educational website. Now, I understand the, the privacy problems involved with this, but if everybody every day upgraded their website, which described them as an individual who is unique and has unique talents and interests and weaknesses and passions and lack of passions and experiences and so and if everybody had a real good website and every day at the end of school upgraded it to what because of what I did today and the teacher was eligible to see that I believe we begin to get towards what we ought to be doing from the standpoint of teaching people I P, uh, I B W, I E W. Try it. I don't think we're doing a good job at all using the, in, using the computer in the institutions of schools. It just makes my job a little more. Uh, I don't know. Just, uh, questions? Dare you? Yes, sir. Oh, you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I love wow, you. Look at that nice vest. Isn't that nice? <laughs> um, I asked my clients all the time if you think beforehand that when you get on the bus to leave, when they're done with this program, if you reflect upon something about their experience or their life, and for you, I think about your life, if you can reflect upon your life, what would the legacy in, in a short not in a short way, but what would the legacy be? Yeah. What's written on my tombstone? Probably maybe two seconds, I, uh, two, two statements. Or, I've thought about this, but I've not been a, a, ever able to be satisfied with. One, he cared. And two, he tried to teach. Now, I don't know whether you remember what Judy said, my first objective in my my. Uh, res resume was. This is the result of a college student who had an IQ of probably 180, and I mean it. She was so smart, it was scary. She asked me one day, she said one day, you do a good job, but you don't know why. Why are you doing what you're doing? i.e., what's your purpose in life? Huh? And I said, well, my purpose, I came back two or three days later or a week later and said, okay, Lois, my objective, my aim in life is to help people. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, you do that. Help people do what? Oh, okay. So I went and played with that one for a month or so. Okay, Lois, sit down. I got it for you. To help people form a philosophy, establish a sen sen sense of values. Ooh, that's good. But what kind of a sense of value? Oh, I gotta go work on that one again? So my aim in life, which is maybe answer to your question, is to help people establish or form a sense of values, i.e. form a philosophy, 
which, enab which will enable, important verb, them to contribute to society. And my legacy, I would like to think, might say he was able to do that with some people. He tried, and he was pretty good at that with some people. Okay? I don't know if that response is that? Thank you. Do you have an aim in life? Can you, can you state it? It took me almost a year. And Lois was on my butt on that. She, boy, she gave me a hard time. And this was when I was, well, this was, what was, it? was 1958 through 1961. And I'm serious, that's a pretty good description of the sequence of that establishment of that aim. Now, by the way, what's the difference between an aim and an objective? An objective is obtainable. An aim is not. An aim gives you direction. You cannot obtain, you can't get to an aim. You can get to an objective, you can get to a goal. To me, a goal is a short-term objective or a, state, a step in obtaining objectives. That's my thinking. But do you have an aim in life? Do you have a professional aim and is that different than your personal one? In my opinion, it shouldn't be. And if you don't, I challenge you to kind of work one up. And don't pick on mine. It's got to be yours. And you got to believe it. Do I believe mine? Do you see that in me? in my behavior. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Brad. Brent. Keith, I, I guess I, um, I'm wondering about your wife and her experience on this journey. I've been sailing with you and your wife and um, seems like a wonderful woman. Um, from what I know of you, she must be a wonderful woman. I, um, <laughs> She's got to be to put up with me for 56 years. Wow. But I can, I sort of, uh, you're known as being a bit exhausting sometimes to people. And I, I just wonder, I just wonder about what her experience has been on this journey. She's been exhausted. <laughs> Love is a very funny thing. It comes up in many, many ways. She's just fabulous. One of the jobs that I had was with Bob MacArthur, and I work now sometimes with a guy named Nat Crane, and my job verbalized with a my job, Bob, if you will agree, accept it, is to make you, expect, make you sex, successful. That's my only function here. My job, Nat, is to make you successful. I'm a tremendously good follower. My wife taught me that. She is the strongest support I could have. Love does funny things. Answer your question. She's fabulous. Questions? Get me off of that one. I, 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 I talk about melting. Huh? Questions? Thank you. How did you meet I was a sophomore at Springfield College, a junior at Springfield College in 1947. I was on the starting 11 for the football team. I was a, an offensive wing back, a defensive tackle. We went both ways those days. And the punter, 
and the, and the place kicking specialist. If we played a 60 minute game, I usually played 62. And after a game, I was tired, worn out, sore, annoyed, elated, depends. And I got in the habit of walking downtown from the college to Down Street and going to the movies on Saturday night because it was a good place. To, it was to be obviously before television and all that kind of stuff. And it was a good place to sit down and just forget the world. And I'd probably eat, find something to eat on the way. This was after the ball game, you know, after you take a shower, and clean up all your mess and rip off the tape that they put on you and all that kind of stuff. And one night, one Saturday night in 1947, I was walking down Main Street in Springfield towards a restaurant to go to the movie. And two women and this guy that I knew, I, he wasn't on the football team, was coming towards me. Oh, hi, Doug. What's going on? Hey, nice game today. Blah, 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 blah. What, what are you doing? Well, looking for a place to eat. Well, come on, we're going to go to eat. And Mary was one of those women. It's never been the same. We married in, well, yeah, we married in 1950. We had an open engagement. If I, we agreed to marry in the fall, in the spring of no, the, yeah, the fall of 50 of 48. She was a working se secretary and stenographer in the A and P headquarters in Springfield. Her home was in West Hampton, Massachusetts, at a, and her father and the rest of the family ran a, uh, a dairy farm and a log and a sawmill. And I, we spent probably every weekend after a while. Work, I went out and worked the farm. And I built this and every Saturday I'd go around and fix all the doors in the, in, in the barn. I mean, doors take a beating in a barn, and that kind of thing. And I worked in the sawmill. And I went out with, a, with her father a couple times and cut down some red, red cedar. Brought it in, milled it, cut it down, milled it, stuck it up, and a year later made her what I would call her despair barrel, her hope chest, out of cedar that I had cut down and milled. That kind of thing in the garage of the farm. Of the farm. I don't know if that answers your question or talks to your question. She's just fabulous. She did a hell of a good job bringing up our kids. You know, you, when you're raising your kids, you kind of wonder how well you're doing. It's a good wonder. The, the answer to that is you watch your grandchildren. And I got six grandchildren and all f six of them are beautiful kids and i'm not saying that as a grandfather i'm saying that as a objective observer <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine me working 108 hours a week huh? and how much i had direct influence on those kids yeah we built our house in Keene on a mile and three quarters away from school so I could walk. That was the only quiet place I had. And the do my, our dog, our Sage, who was called Sage, was a mix between a Border Collie and a German Shepherd, a, do a black German Shepherd looked like. She, she had the, the, the temperament of the Collie and the looks of the, of the Shepherd, and she would take me to school. And that was the only quiet place I ever had. Because when I was home, home was important. When I was in school, school was important. I had about four different routes to get home at five or six or seven o'clock at night. And lots of times I took the long way home. It took me an hour and 20 minutes to walk home the long way of two and a half miles, three, three miles, because I needed the quiet. And she just had supper there when I got home. Well, she grew up in a farm family and knew how to work. And she knew how to put up with a crazy bastard like me. 
question. Sh Ma'am. You gave it to me. She asked me something about, well, isn't that guy as a guide? I, I have now five words I need to define. Instructor, teacher, facilitator, leader, and guide. I'm still working on that. And I thank you for that. And I haven't had a chance to think about it long enough, but it certainly is there. A facilitator is a person who, cont who has, the f has the use of a facility, facilitator, and gives people a chance to learn there. Probably doesn't involve an awful lot of, of guidance, just allows it to occur and probably picks up when it's done. All right? A leader is somebody who you as a group and the leader as have agreed to get you, get them or you to a certain place and helps you get there. And generally, a good definition of leadership in my thinking is if it goes well, the leader gives the credit to the group. If it goes poorly, the leader takes the blame for it. Well, I'm not being facetious, a, a little bit maybe, or not complete, I guess. I don't know what guide means yet. I don't yet know what guide means, which, but I have plugged it into my, I've now got five, I had four. Thank you. I asked you to remind me of that, and I thank you for it. Question, yes, sir. I believe very strongly in the Springfield Triangle, which is the same thing as the YMCA Triangle. The mind, the spirit, and the body are all equal. It's, a isos it's an equilateral triangle. I don't think we spend an awful lot of, enough time on getting people to understand the value of the body, but I also believe we don't spend any time at all on the interconnection of all the three. I don't know if that answers, or put it another way, if we, when we work with people, work with a whole person and where they are, not where we think we would like to have them be, to get them to where they think they want to be, not where I think they ought to be, I think we'd be a hell of a lot better off. I don't know if that speaks to you or not. Thank you. We, we done. I don't know. I guess we're done. I thank you. <laughs> you talk again about being wrapped up in your work. Good job. <laughs> That was great. Good. I'm really glad that's done. Um, and next up, what's going on next? 
I believe, if I'm correct, the Dog Day players? I just like to, I'm glad I get to announce the Dog Day players because they're from Dartmouth. And I wasn't even aware that they were coming. And I can speak from personal experience that they are unbelievably funny and you guys are gonna love them. So, here they come. Dog Day players, Dartmouth College. You. you know how to do it. Thank you. We are the Dog Day Players. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Hannah, our fearless leader. We are an improv group from Dartmouth College, um, and we're just going to start out really quickly with, a, with our first game. So our first game is a game 